I certainly want to express our appreciation today for the presence of each one of you that are here. We are thrilled, delighted that you have come to be with us today. We do look forward to hearing the lesson tonight. Brother Iverson always look forward to his lessons and his work as far as the work in India is concerned. It is amazing work and uh, the work that he does is an amazing work. God has blessed him and blessed our brethren in that area. We look forward to that. Hope that you can be here tonight. And just one month away at this particular point from our gospel meeting, Brother Keith Parker will be with us. We're looking forward to this. Brother Parker is an outstanding preacher of the gospel. He holds powerful gospel meetings with a great deal of results, and we are looking forward to the kind of work that he will do. We want to get all the people we can to come to hear him. Keep thinking with regard to that, and we'll be looking forward to a great gospel meeting. I want to talk to you today on the subject of the impartiality of God. Impartiality is a characteristic that should be characteristic of all of us. We should be people recognizing that God is impartial. God loves everybody. God loves the entire world. God loves us even when we do not love him. But nevertheless, we need to recognize that God disciplines his children. He is concerned about their welfare. We're going to look at the impartiality of God. First of all, we look at four passages here that really say very much the same kind of thing. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, There is no respect of persons with God. And in 2 Samuel 14, 14, it says, Neither doth God respect any person. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 17, the Father who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work. And the one you heard re read just a moment ago, Bobby was reading to us, it says in Acts 10 and verse 34, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Sometimes men show partiality. That should not be the character, the kind of thing that we do. Sometimes parents show, care, show partiality to their children. I look back with regard to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There is a strain of partiality that was shown all along the way and caused a great deal of trouble as far as their families were concerned. You remember that Abraham was looking for that child of promise, Isaac, and when it took so long for that to happen, they decided to use uh, an opportunity for them to have a child in another way. And Ishmael was born, but that wasn't the child of promise. That wasn't God's intention. And when Isaac finally was born, there was problems in the family because they were trying to help God out. When people try to help God out, he doesn't need any help, but when they try to help God out, they bring a great many problems upon themselves. That was true with regard to the family, family of Abraham. And I think as you come on down, Isaac, you remember, as we think about him and his family, two children, and among those two children, we find him having a great concern and interest in one child. The mother was interested in one. The father was interested in the other. There's Jacob and Esau. Uh, we find that the mother loved Jacob and the father loved Esau. And there was division in the family because of this, and treachery was brought into it. And you remember how that Jacob was driven away because of the hatred of his brother, because of the, him getting the birthright that he did not, he got it through treachery, and he stayed away for 20 years before he came back home. And this was all because of that kind of partiality that was shown between these parents. You think they would learn a lesson. But Jacob, you remember, had 12 sons, and he had a favorite child, and the kind of grief that that brought. He made a coat of many colors for Joseph, and it didn't make Joseph in, in the long run very happy because his brothers were so jealous of him. The problem was, of course, that there was a favorite wife, and he loved uh, her more than he did the other one, and uh, so he loved Joseph, and Joseph was 
was sent by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. And they told his father, in effect, that, the, that his son was dead. They didn't really say that, but they implied it. And he said, I'll go down to my grave in grief because of this. But all of this is because of the kind of partiality, and it goes through the family over and over again. And it happens in many families today. One child will say, I know mother loved you more than she did me, or my dad loved you more than he did me, and it's something that causes families to be unhappy. Uh, many people don't realize that they don't they that they are showing partiality. They will tell you that they love all their children the same, but the truth is children respond differently. So it's hard to really treat children exactly alike since some are very responsive in a good way and some are not very responsive in a good way and there are problems that arise. But I say all that to say that God is absolutely impartial. It is so important for us to realize that we too, if we have the kind of attitude that God would have us to have, we should deal impartially with people. It is particularly important for parents. It's important for teachers. Maybe you have known some teachers that had their pets. Maybe you were one of the teacher's pets. I didn't have much problem along that line, but uh, nevertheless, I, I know that it's not good for teacher to have pets, and uh, it makes for an unhappy situation. Teachers ought to treat their students the same kind of way. It's also important in the workplace for a business manager to treat the employees in the same kind of way. It is particularly important for a judge to be impartial. All of us know that. Whether we're talking about parents, teachers, business managers, or judge, it is necessary for people to be impartial if things are to go well as they should. But above all things, we need to remember that God is impartial. Uh, we need to realize that uh, we are all his creatures, and God treats all of us exactly alike. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9, it teaches that we're all equally related to him. This passage says, we have, an earth, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected, respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? We dealt with our earthly parents, but he is saying, here is God and his relationship to, his, to us, and that we need to respect him, we need to be subject to him. He is the Father of spirits, and he is one that is absolutely impartial. He does not desire that any should perish. Remember the statement that Peter made in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 where he says that he does not desire that any should perish. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but he goes ahead to say he is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us to be right. He wants us to be saved, and he would do whatever he can in order that we might be saved. I want to talk to you about this impartiality from a number of different standpoints, a number of things that teach the evidence of this. I know a lot of people feel that, that maybe it wouldn't, that they couldn't pray. Other people could pray and God will hear them, but if they prayed, God would not listen to them. It wouldn't get higher than the ceiling. The truth of the matter is God wants all of us to pray to him. He wants all of us to be his children. He wants all of us to obey his will, and we need to understand that while it is true that all have sinned, and there, that's the first point I want us to notice, we all stand equally before God in the sense that all have sinned. The scripture says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As we look at it from that kind of standpoint, God wants everybody to be saved and he made arrangements in order that people can have an opportunity to come to God. All have sinned. But let me suggest to you that even the very best of people in the Bible, their sins are plainly pointed out. Abraham is called the friend of God. But you'll find that with regard to this great and good man that had been called out of Ur of Chaldees, and God made promise to him that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed, he was a man like other men, 
and he was frightened at the idea that because of his wife that he might be killed. In Genesis chapter 12, 11, and 13, it says when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is, my, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say that you are my sister, that my life may be spared for your sake. What's he doing? He's telling his wife to lie. She was a half-sister. She was a half-sister, but the truth was he was, she was far more than a half-sister. She was his wife, and he is telling her to be deceptive in that kind of regard, and it was something that brought great grief to him here and on other occasions also. He did this on two different occasions. So what I'm saying is, here this great man that is a friend of God, Abraham, is guilty of lying. You come on down to David. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verses 2 through 4, we find David walking on the roof in the cool of the evening and looking out and seeing Bathsheba bathing. He didn't stop there. He called for her and they committed adultery and a child was born and he arranged for her husband to be killed one sin after another. And here's a man, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. But he was, while he was a good man in so many ways, and he repents of this, and he, he says, my sin is ever before me, and he, he prays that the Lord will forgive him, and God does forgive David, but it was a terrible sin, and God hated the sin of David, even though he was a penitent man, and God had forgiven him. What I'm saying is that God doesn't cover up. Even these good men, such as Abraham and David, and looking on down into the New Testament to the, the Apostle Peter. Peter was the one who had first confessed Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. He preached the first gospel sermon in Acts the second chapter. Thousands obeyed the gospel. But many, many years later in Galatians 2 and verse 11, we find here it said, that when Peter came to Antioch, Paul said, I opposed him to the face because he stood condemned. He had shown favoritism with regard to the Jews, and uh, he was not one that uh, he had separated himself from the Gentiles. He had shown an unchristian attitude. God had made both Jew and Gentile one, but Peter didn't have the courage at that particular point when the Jews came down to stand for what he knew was right. And Paul says, I condemned him to the face because he was to be condemned. What I'm saying is the Bible records the sins of even the good people. He is not one that is partial. He doesn't just decide that he's going to cover up those things that, that the good people do. So we need to recognize that not only is God impartial in that he, under the same condemnation, shows the sins of the good people, but also by say that God is impartial, and let me catch up with what I'm doing here, he showed the same condemnation in these things, and we find him, and those are the passages that we talked about, he also shows the same love. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, the scripture says, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only does God love, according to this passage, but Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in 1 John 4 and verse 10, it tells us that God is love. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sin. God loves us the same love for every person, even while they were yet sinners, God's love was extended. And he's willing to send the sacrifice, and the same sacrifice is made for all of the people of the world. Again, John 3, 16, God sent his only begotten son. He loved us and sent his only begotten son in order that we might be saved. 
And that passage in John 2 and verse 2 tells us that God, God is love and he loves us and he'll do whatever we can to help us in order to be saved. The sacrifice that Jesus was willing to make. And the same gospel. There's not a different gospel for some people and a different gospel for special people. If there was ever a time that there might need to have been a different gospel for the Jews and a, a separate gospel for the Gentiles, it would have been there in the New Testament church in the very beginning of the Lord's church. But he broke down the middle wall of petition between them. The same gospel was to be preached to every, everyone. There was no difference made between them. And Jesus, in giving the Great Commission, said in Mark 16, 15, and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And in Matthew 28, 19, we find him saying, Go to make disciples of all nations, teaching, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. So the same command to teach and to baptize and to make disciples of all the people, of all the nations, of all of the earth. In Galatians 1 and verse 8, he makes it very plain that if anyone would preach any other gospel, in fact, he says, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, there was just one gospel for all of the people of the world, no matter what color, no matter what kind of background, no matter what kind of circumstance they come from, because God simply is impartial, the same message is for everyone, and the same invitation. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. The closing chapter of the book of God, Revelation 22, 17 says, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the Bride, which is the Lord's church, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him that is the thirst come. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. We need to realize that God wants us to come to him. He wants everyone to come to him in order that they might be saved. This message goes out to everyone in all of the world, and we are to see and to realize the importance of getting that message to them. In John 6 and verse 37, him, he says, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. God wants everybody to be saved. There are a lot of people who have the attitude that others can, others can be saved, but I'm just one of life's great losers. There's simply no hope for me. Others may have hope of being saved, but I just can't make it. We need to get rid of that idea. We need to realize that God wants you to be saved. He will do whatever he can to help you along life's way to bless you. Not only the same invitation, the same gospel, the same sacrifice, the same love, but also the same terms of condition. Again, Mark 16, 16, what are the conditions? The terms of entrance into the kingdom. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Uh, Jesus said, preach the gospel, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And as Paul said in Romans 1, 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the statement in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, we find him saying there, the you there trouble rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it's the same terms, the same invitation, the same gospel, all of that. And when people obey that gospel, they are added to the same church. There's not a different church for different people. There is that one church. Jesus promised to build his church. He built his church. As you look into the scripture, we find him adding to them, Acts 2, 30, 41. After that first gospel sermon was preached, the Bible says, Then they that glad to receive the word were baptized, and the Lord added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Continuing on in that same chapter, verse 47 says, 
praising God and favor, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to them day by day, such as were being saved. Added to what? Added to the church. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5 says that there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This is that one body, which is the one church. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23 says, He gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church is the body. And here in Ephesians 4, he is saying that there is one body. That means that God just sent one church. Jesus just built one church. And it is for everybody because God is impartial. All of these people have the same standard, the same terms of forgiveness. Talking about the matter of the same standard. Let's notice what it says in Galatians 3.20. Uh, eight, that speaks here to the effect that, that those who are added to the church, the truth of the matter was that by, that by faith, they, and they're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. He said, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How does one get into Christ? By being baptized into Christ. And that's true of every person in all the world. There's just one passage that tells us how to get into Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. This is the standard by which, by which all are to be saved. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8 and 9, it says, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? There's the danger as far as the church is concerned with regard to the kind of conduct that should characterize the Lord's church. We can be leavened by the leaven of this world. We're warned against that kind of thing. We're told that uh, we're not to preach any other gospel. We're to stand for what is right because God's message is the same for everybody. And we need to understand that that's the case. Romans chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken the same shall judge him. Again, it's that same standard by which we will be judged before, as we stand before the judge of all of the earth. We are facing a God that is an impartial God. Same condemnation because all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. The same love. God so loved the world. We need to be impressed by that marvelous love that God has. So many sermons have been preached on love. People sing about love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the thing that there's too little of. But we need to understand that God loves everybody alike. All of us are equal before him. We need to understand that the requirements, the gospel, the invitation, the same terms, the same church, the same standard, and the same judgment will face every one of us. We find him saying in Romans chapter 20 and verse 12, I saw, I saw a great white throne and him that sat thereon from whose face the earth and heavens were fled away. And he tells that the books were opened and the dead were judged according to the things, things that were written in the books. The truth of the matter is we need to know that we shall stand there one day. Revelation 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead small and great. In Romans 14 and verse 2 it says, Each one of us must give an account of himself before God. It's great to have a good wife or a good mother or a good father, but you won't be saved on what they did. You'll be judged on what you do. All of us will be judged according to the things that we have done, the deeds which we have done in the body. It's important then for us to realize that all must stand before that judgment seat and give an account with regard to these things. And then finally, as we come toward the close, there is the same reward. The same reward for everybody those that are saved will hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. 
to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. God help us to realize what a wonderful thing it is to receive the blessings that come in that kind of way. We need to respect the fact that we are to be faithful to the end. Matthew 13 and verse 13, we find him saying that it's the person that is faithful to the end that will, that will be saved. And Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. My friends today, all of us stand on the same equal plane before God. If we will obey him, if we will obey the gospel of Christ, we can hear him say, well done. He will add us to his church. He will help us along life's way and bless us here and finally give us a home in glory. But on the other hand, if we refuse and turn away from what God would have us to be, the same kind of condemnation. God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, every race, every background, wise and unwise, those who are educated and uneducated, whatever the circumstance may be, God loves you. I hear people say, smile, God loves you. But we smile that God loves us if, if we are willing to accept his terms of forgiveness if we're willing to accept his terms by which we can be blessed. All spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. But today are you in Christ Jesus? Have you confessed your faith in Jesus Christ to be buried with your Lord in baptism? And are you walking faithful day by day? If not, why not today come to make your life right before God our prayer is that you will, and do it now as together we stand and as we sing.